Welcome to this presentation for Kilted Ancestors. Kilted Ancestors is a private Facebook group set up as a meeting place for those with Scottish ancestry. Regardless if you research your own family history or not, preserving the stories handed down by your parents or grandparents is so important. The group is an amazing place to not only share the challenges faced in your own research, but to obtain inspiration to tell the story of your own family's journey. 2022 is Scotland's Year of Stories, and during this year, Claire Wilson and Christine Woodcock will be bringing a whole host of free events and activities to group members, many of them via Facebook Live events. You can join the group by searching Kilted Ancestors on Facebook, or if you would like to subscribe to the newsletter, visit www.treehousegenealogy.co.uk forward slash Kilted Ancestors. Taking things that bit further, Claire and Christine have also set up a quarterly virtual conference named Kilted Culture, which again embraces Scotland's Year of Stories. This is based on four separate themes and has some really amazing guest speakers. You can book one, two, three or all of the events and if you book all four you will obtain a free bonus event which will show you how to pull your own family story together. You can view details of the speakers and topics and book now via Christine's website at www.genealogyvic.com and let's move on with today's speaker. Hi everyone. Uh, we thought we would surprise you today. We didn't announce it in the group and we just thought we would come in today and do a quick Facebook Live. Christine, how are you? Good, really good. Good, how's your summer been? Uh, boring. <laughs> <laughs> okay straight to the point any research I no 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 i haven't done much um i moved oh yes yeah, so that's uh, that, that took all my time and energy so um but yeah and it's been fabulous weather wise so we've been able to get out quite a bit but in terms of research and that stuff nothing 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 i'm quiet I'm quiet. Oh, yeah, quiet. I've been quite a quiet. I've been away on holiday and I'm trying to kind of catch up with the Kilted Ancestors prompts um, to do blog posts. I've actually just done the police one, which was I think in June. So I've got the weaving one, got a lot of weaving ancestors to do. And then what one are we on at the moment? Um, oh yeah, we're on, I think we're still on weaving, aren't we? Oh no, we're on fishing, agriculture and fishing. Ah, and then okay. yeah and then the next month we're actually going into steelworks and mining and different things as well yeah i'll go i'll mm -hmm. in then yeah so i'm a bit behind need to catch up but the exciting thing actually was that um i had a guy from australia contact me he mm -hmm. found one of my blog posts that i've i've done for kilted ancestors where i covered a story about a family and there was a cousin of my grandfather's couldn't work out where she went. I knew who she'd married, what the guy's name was, just couldn't trace them, you know, in, UK, in the UK, on Ancestry, everywhere that I looked. And he's descended from this lady that was my, my grandfather's cousin. Oh, so wow. it just shows that, you know, actually blogging about that and actually writing a bit more about my family's found this link that I was struggling to find. So, so that's quite exciting. That is exciting. I had the similar thing. It was a few years ago, um, and I had written about my great uncle, so my my grandpa's brother, and he left for America, and then nobody ever seemed to know what happened. And so I found out his whole story, and I did a blog post. His grandson contacted me, um, and I actually was able to meet up with him. Uh, it was just yeah, it's amazing. It's like, and it was the same. He just got on Google, put in the name of his grandfather. He knew nothing about him, and Mm -hmm. I popped my blog post and that was it so well this, this guy was the same this guy was the same. so it just shows you that obviously it works it does work maybe i should be doing a talk on um you know blogging, blogging. and yeah yeah and uh, getting found that way yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other exciting thing that i've actually got is now was it a week two weeks ago i got an invite from the ministry of defense um to go out to holland for 
um, a funeral um, for a, an airman I researched a couple of years ago with a historian in Holland. Um, the guy was from Liverpool and he was shot down in 1940. And quite a few years later, um, I think it was in the 1980s or the 1990s, this um, group of historians from Holland lifted this aircraft out of the canal. And while they did so, they found human remains. So one of the guys had managed to bail out and was, was able to tell the kind of story. So it was obvious who, this, who, who, who the remains belonged to. Um, but we did a lot of research into the family and tried to trace living family members and, and various, you know, tell the guy's story. And we're fighting with the Ministry of Defence to try and get the guy a military funeral and a ward grave. So, um, yeah, it's coming up in the next wee while and I will do a blog post to follow up on it. So um, none of the family members can make it. So my husband said, no, no, you really need to go. You need to follow this right through. And, um, so in some ways, I'm really happy that, you know, I'm going and it's quite exciting. But then I just feel honoured that I was able to Absolutely. ensure that this guy gets, you know, after 82 years, the guy's, you know, going to be buried with my Finally. owners. Yeah. Finally. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's good well, to see Good it for you. Now. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Very, very exciting. I know. I know. So yeah, I'll give the, the story and photographs and, you know, tell the guy's story afterwards and share it with everyone as well. Maybe do a wee um, uh, video or something. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do yeah. that. Yeah, I can maybe do a video and a, a blog post. I like to do both now. It's funny. You know, yeah. just a slideshow is and, you know, because yeah, people yeah. catch things in different ways. Different so. ways, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the next thing that we've got going on is the next Kilted Culture. Um, mm, it's like two weeks away. I know, Not I can't even. believe it. I know. can't believe yeah. it. Joanne. All of these, though, you know. We started yeah. out, it was just, it hasn't even been a year since we started planning. I know. And every single one always seems so far away, and then suddenly it's here. I know. And I've been sharing quite a bit of, of this um, over the last couple of weeks, and there seems to be quite a bit of interest. Um, occupations. Yeah, yeah, occupations in industry. Um, I think, you know, if you are struggling to find out a bit more on your family member, what they did, how to get records, etc., this is the one for you, um, because it does give a lot more information on, you know, what your ancestors' day-to-day -day life would have been if they're in particular industries. Have you got the speaker details to share? Uh, I do. I'm just trying to keep the dog out of the way here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there was a, it was a newscaster for our national, you know how you have BBC, well, we have CBC, CB, yeah, CBC. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was doing one from home and her dog kept jumping in and jumping up on her shoulder. <laughs> Uh, she finally just gave up and let the dog do whatever it wanted. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have Justin Parks, and Justin is with um, what's the name of the place? Summerly. Summerly, yeah, yeah, fabulous place to visit, by the way, if people haven't. Um, and he is going to talk about the Scottish Steelworks and coal-fired iron industry. Um, for, oh, it says right there. Um, we have Stephen Clancy, who is from Paisley, and he's going to talk about. Paisley Weavers and the lives of the, the Weavers and some of the records for uh, finding out about them. We have uh, uh, Irene, who is always very popular as a speaker. Yeah. And her talk topic is my ancestor was. So she'll look at different kinds of um, records and uh, for finding out about your ancestors' occupation and, and their lives. And we have the ever popular Neil Fraser from Historic Environment Scotland. He also does a fabulous, oh, actually all of them do. I don't know why I'm you know, mm. pinpointing these two, but because um, uh, Scott, Scott, Stephen is also excellent. I haven't heard Dustin yet, but um, the uh, Neil will talk about the um, resources in the uh, Historic Environment Scotland's industrial collection. Um, and you know what, that's really a good place to look if you're, um, it, it, they have a lot of old photographs. Yeah. So if your ancestor worked, say, in a mine that no longer exists or ironworks that no longer exists, you'll be able to maybe find a photo of that. Um, so yeah, we're really looking forward to all of these. Oh. And you can uh, register by going to genealogypick.com. Yep, so it's on the 10th of September. It is. 
10th of September, which is 2 p.m. Um, in the UK. And what time is that? Uh, nine Eastern. here. Nine Eastern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and don't worry if you can't make it on the day. The recordings will be available for 30 days, um, which is great because you can fit things around about um, what you've got planned. So don't worry about you know having to sit in on a Saturday afternoon if the weather's nice or you've got something planned, you can catch up. Um, another time and we do have quite a few door prizes available on the day as well so you might be lucky enough to win a door prize which kind of covers the price of your ticket absolutely yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. and it's only a tenner I mean it's not like we're you know asking for hundreds of pounds okay. it's I mean, really just enough to cover we want to we want to honor the speakers and pay them and thank them for yeah their... yeah I mean, it does take, I mean, I'm, I'm a genealogist as well. It does take quite a bit of time to pull together the information, re research it, get it written down, get your presentation designed, all the rest of it. So, you know, it is important that we do pay the speakers. Um, they do a great job. And, you know, probably the amount that, you know, speakers do get paid, you know, gradually. If maybe maybe covers one or two hours out of what, six or mm -hmm. seven or eight that it takes. Exactly. I know. Yeah. I know. So. Um, if you're rolling talk out multiple times, then I suppose through time it's been, you know, for the time that you initially <laughs> did, but uh, it's a good way of promoting things as well. And yeah, we like to make sure that they're paid. Um, okay, so we have a presentation for you today. It was actually pre-recorded because this gentleman has just became so busy with his business now. Um, it's a presentation from Graham Johncock of Scotland Stories. He has a fabulous website um, and he has a, a blog as well. So you can actually subscribe for free to his blog and he tells so many interesting stories all about Scotland. So we'll share the presentation and we will put links to um, Graham's uh, website in the chat afterwards as well. He's also on Instagram. Yeah. 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 So yeah, we'll put some links in anyway so that yeah. everyone can Good. find it. Let me see if I can get this to work. Oh, there he is. <laughs> okay, let's go. Hi there. Uh, my name is Graham from Scotland Stories. Uh, you can usually find me exploring as many of Scotland's nooks and crannies as I can to find and share fascinating stories over on my blog or Instagram, Facebook, all that sort of stuff. Now, I did originally have a PowerPoint to share with you, but due to some technical difficulties, you're uh, stuck looking at my face for the next 15 minutes or so. But, and when it comes to the topic of crime and punishment, I've got lots of stories to choose from. Now, it's not that Scotland has a particularly high crime rate or exceptionally brutal repercussions, but some of the wilder parts of the country used to essentially have their own justice system. You know, cattle raids on neighbours were pretty much commonplace, almost accepted and just endured. And technically, every clan member could have been classed as a criminal, or at the very least, aiding and abetting them. Now, Rob Roy McGregor, probably the most famous. Uh, in fact, at one point, the name McGregor itself was outlawed. After the Jacobite Risings, especially in 1745, hundreds of people were classed, not just as criminals, but as traitors. I mean, that's far too big a topic to get into just now. Um, but many might say the ones doing the punishing after Culloden were the real criminals. But long before that, William Wallace, Robert the Bruce, they were both branded outlaws, criminals, but also freedom fighters and heroes. So as you can see, crime and punishment is a pretty packed category. But I'm not going to talk to you about any of that. I'm going down maybe the gorier route of crime with uh, three stories, and each of them feature plenty of death and destruction. Now the first of these is said to have taken place in the 16th century. Although nobody's entirely sure if it's true or not. However, the story goes that in his younger days, a man called Sonny Bean was a bit of a layabout. He didn't want to follow in his father's footsteps, becoming a hard-working hedger and ditcher, so he ran away from home. Without any legal way of earning money, Sonny lived a life of petty crime. But it wasn't all bad, though. He met the love of his life, and fortunately for him, she was just as depraved and cruel as he was. The young couple, they moved in together, but not into a lovely marital cottage. No, to save on paying rent, they moved into a hidden cave in Ayrshire. They had plenty of children, eight sons, six daughters and all, but with extra mouths to feed, petty theft just wasn't going to cut it anymore. Sonny and his wife, 
where he would lay and wait on the roads around their little hidden cave until just the right prey passed by. You know, a lone rider was pretty good, somebody they could make sure wasn't going to escape them. They also hoped nobody was going to miss them because they didn't just rob their victims. Sonny Bean and his wife murdered them as well. They took the bodies back to their ever-increasing brood because they weren't going to let anything go to waste. Sonny and his family were cannibals. It said that they drank human blood like wine. They chopped off limbs and they hung bodies from the cave ceiling like they were on butcher's hooks. Anything they didn't gorge themselves on right away, they would pickle in a barrel for later. Before long, the old locals, obviously, they started to notice people going missing. And they searched the shoreline. But Sonny Bean's cave was too well hidden, only accessible for very small periods during low tide. Every so often, a hand or a foot would wash up and they had no marks on it. Everybody assumed, well, the disappearances must be down to wild animals. As Sonny's children grew into adults, they joined the family business. And now, hunting like a pack, they could take on more than just solitary travellers. They needed to as well, because those eight sons and six daughters had multiplied again into 18 grandsons and 14 granddaughters. Cave-dwelling cannibals they weren't the most attractive candidates on the dating scene, but that didn't matter, because they just bred with each other. Over a thousand people had gone missing over the years, but the cannibals, they managed to avoid detection. Until everything went wrong for Sonny Bean and his clan, when he attacked a man and wife returning from the county fair. Now this man was something of a champion fighter, so with his sword drawn, he was doing his best to hold off his attackers. The poor wife, on the other hand, well, she was quickly dragged to the floor, her clothes ripped to shreds by manic hands, before she was sliced open and the cannibals started to devour her there and then. Stunned, but no doubt fighting harder than ever now, the man was relieved when a large group appeared on the road, also returning from the fair. Sonny must have realised they were outnumbered, it was hopeless, so the family fled off to the woods, but for the very first time they had left behind a witness and a corpse. The traumatised husband reported what had happened to the magistrate and his story went right to the top. King James himself arrived in Ayrshire with a large force of armed men and trained hunting hounds. They scoured the coast and while their eyes found nothing, the dogs couldn't miss the stench of human blood. The king and his soldiers followed the hounds to a cave. At low tide, they entered to the most horrific sight imaginable. Piles of clothes, jewellery, other possessions littered the floor, while the walls were covered in rows and rows of human body parts. At the back of the cave, surrounded by hundreds of nibbled human bones, was Sonny Bean and his clan of cannibals. There was no escape for them. And the soldiers dragged the family to Edinburgh to meet their justice, while the king ordered what was left of the mangled body parts to be given a proper burial. No trial was deemed necessary. The man, the men, sorry, had their hands and feet chopped off and they were left to bleed to death. The women were burned at the stake. And I think that maybe well and truly ticks the box for punishment. There might be no official records, any cannibal hunts like this in Scotland, but the story of Sonny Bean, still widely told and just as widely accepted. But maybe this episode, it was so shocking that all official evidence was destroyed. After all, James VI, well, he was looking forward to becoming King of England in the very near future. So something like this may have been a little embarrassing for him. But I guess we'll never know. The next tale, though, we could be absolutely certain of, because it features two of Edinburgh's most infamous criminals, William Burke and William Hare. Now, they prowled around in the early 1800s, and Edinburgh was at the forefront of modern medicine. Now, you might think that makes it one of the safest places in the world to live. You'd be very wrong. It'd be particularly dangerous, especially at night. Because it took a lot of fresh bodies to keep their anatomy classes running for all those medical students. A change in the law had resulted in a shortage of legal cadavers. But some enterprising people saw an opportunity selling the recently deceased. You know, a petty crime, but a profitable one. The theft of freshly buried corpses got so bad, people had to protect their loved ones after the funeral. In old graveyards, 
You can still see watchtowers where a guard was posted and strong iron mort safes on graves, strong metal bars to deter any would-be snatchers. There's a common misconception that Burke and Hare were grave snatchers, but in reality they found a very different way to conduct their business. Hare ran a lodging house in Tanner's Close. One day a lodger died of natural causes before he could draw on his pension and pay the bill. Hare had lost out on the rent, but news had spread about this shortage of bodies at the university. So he and Burke replaced the body in the coffin before it could be buried, and they carted it along to Surgeon's Square to sell to Dr Robert Knox for a very hefty price. Before they left, Knox's aide was sure to mention that you know, if you stumble upon any other cadavers, you know where to bring them. Well, this was easier money than scraping a living in Edinburgh slums, but they needed more bodies. Over the next ten months, Burke and Hare murdered 16 people, usually by luring the targets back to a logic their lodging house, plying them full of whiskey and then suffocating them. One man covered the mouth and the nose, the other sat on the chest and squeezed out the air. A system that would forever known henceforth as burking. The word herring was already taken. Now while the bodies are still warm, these heartless criminals, they'd stuff them into a tea chest and rush them down the cowgate along to the uni. The list of victims is detailed. But the most disturbing of all was a popular young lad with a limp called Daft Jamie. They said the students began to murmur with recognition as his body was being wheeled in. So Dr Knox cut off his feet and dissected his face first. That led many to suspect that he knew about the murders all along. Eventually the duo were caught. Hare decided to give up Burke to save his own skin. And I mean literally save his own skin. Because after he was executed, after Burke was executed, he was dissected as revenge for all of those victims. The surgeon wrote a note using his blood as ink. His skin was then used to make macabre book covers. And his skeleton is still on display in the museum. Meanwhile, Hare was released but chased out of Edinburgh. Nobody knows where he ended up. Or if he decided to carry on with his murderous enterprise somewhere else. Maybe he's one of the characters in this last story, which follows in the same vein, but you'll be pleased to hear it's a slightly more light-hearted note. So one dark night, a pair of disrespectful grave robbers set about the theft of a very fresh body. The man had been cut down in the prime of his life. You know, not a boy anymore, but far from an old man. This was a corpse that was going to fetch good money. It wasn't their first dig. Uh, that night. Before long, they had the dead man in the back of their car and they were filling in the six-foot hole. Rumbling along the road back home, our two villains saw the welcoming lights of the pub. Well, you know, digging works up a bit of a thirst, so if we're going to make a decent profit, profit, why not stop for a wee celebration? They didn't know the area very well, they didn't want to take any chances, so rather than leave their cart and their cargo unguarded, one of the two came up with a novel idea. They took the corpse from the back. They sat him upright on a driver's bench, covering the shroud in a coat and a big floppy hat. Off they went, into the warmth, chuckling at the ruse and the human scarecrow. As the grave robbers entered the pub, one of the local men came out. He was about to make his journey home, and he wandered past the car, shouting a cheery hello to the deceased cart driver. Of course, he received no answer. He said, I said... It's a cold evening, is it no? Still no reply. He'd had a few too many shandies. He wasn't very happy about being ignored, so he wandered over to see what this ignorant fool's problem was. Then he stopped in his tracks. First he saw the shroud, and then he saw the shovels in the back of the cart. Good honest people don't take kindly to grave robbers, especially this one knew exactly who that body belonged to. It was time to teach the scoundrels a lesson. The man carefully lowered the body down, stashed it in a shadowy bush for later. Then he donned the big coat and the floppy hat. He took the empty spot on the driver's bench. After a few drams, the grave robbers stumbled out of the pub back to their cart. They weren't too far from home, probably too inebriated to manhandle the corpse back into the cart, so they just left it where it sat. And they perched themselves either side, stop it flopping over. As they rumbled along the track, the man on the left was just dozing off when he felt a sharp nudge in his side. He said, would you stop poking me while I'm sleeping? 
The other guy replies, oh, nothing like it, just hud your wish. Then the man on the right felt something on his leg. Looking down, he saw the corpse's hand had fallen on him. He went to move it back when he froze in confusion. He said that the corpse is still warm. Then between the two grave robbers, a deep voice boomed out. Aye, you'd be warm too if you'd just come back for hell. That's it. The two criminals had never run so fast in their lives. The body they'd stolen, that would be returned to its rightful place. And we can only hope that that experience put them off their moonlit thieving for good. Well, thanks very much for listening. And on the other hand, or sorry, on one hand, I hope you've learned some valuable lessons about crime and morality and punishment. On the other hand, I hope none of you were sitting on the fence about cannibalism, murder or grave robbing anyway. If you want to let them, uh, find out some more stories, you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter as Scotland Stories, um, on my blog as well. Um, there's a lot of articles up there and some storytellings go up. Uh, you can sign up to my newsletter, you can keep in touch, whatever. It would be fantastic to have you there. So anyway, thanks very much for listening. So good. I know. So good. He's such a great story, fella. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I um, love that one of the, uh, the last one there. Mm -hmm. Could you just imagine? <laughs> I know. I know. And actually, the Sonny Bean one was the one that I covered the first month in January for the kind of folklore and oh yeah, yeah you know so it kind of fits in with the folklore but also the crime kind of topic so yeah thank I, you so much to Graham for for providing that um yeah he's just such I a guess. great speaker yes so just he was saying um and I've been the the um Burke skeleton is in um the anatomy museum and it's only open the last Saturday of every month unless it's open during doors open but right now it is on display at the national library or sorry the national museum they have a uh uh what is it called they have a display on right now about that um and they, because there was a story on about them moving it matter of life and death at the national museum so they've got the story of burke and Hare there um this is in edinburgh and the um burke skeleton it's normally at the anatomy museum has been moved down to the national museum for this uh exhibit look at that and i'm in canada and i knew that claire i know hold on a minute i've actually just found it um let me just share my screen all right that's on my list for you next yeah. week next week week after yeah, so there you go, 2nd of July to the 30th of October, from 10 till 5. Yeah, that was pretty good. I actually fancy going to the Anatomy Museum, I know it seems a bit gory, but um, yeah. It's really, it's quite fascinating, actually. It's not very big, um, but it's really fascinating. They have a number of skulls. Uh, they have Burks and hairs. I think they have... Uh, is it Stevenson? Who's the other writer? Probably Robbie not. Burns. Burns, I think. One yeah. of them. They have one. Yeah, I think maybe it's Burns. They have his skull as well. Yeah. Well, that's quite interesting. And mm -hmm. then you've got, is that, it's, I mean, there's the Surgeon's Halls Museum as well in Edinburgh, which I think. Yeah, and for, there they have uh, one of the wallets that was made, one of the handbooks that was made for out of his skin. Right. Unfortunately, with the Surgeon's Hall and the, I mean, I understand, and the Anatomy Museum, you can't take photographs. And that may be the same at this exhibit because it's disrespectful to the human uh, mm. deceased, right? Yeah. But um, it's absolutely fascinating. I grew up listening to stories of Burke and Hare. My mother, everybody else listened to, you know, uh, sugar plums <laughs> dancing in their hands. And my mother was like, my mother was a psychiatric nurse and then she went on to become a just a general nurse and um you know just was full of that I, I remember the first time i i think i did one of those hop on hop off bus tours in edinburgh and just actually saw the watchtower um at saint cuthbert's and i'm like oh my god it's real <laughs> she was telling me the truth <laughs> yeah so i mean your local cemetery has you know a watch house yeah so well it's got the watch house 
Oh, um, watch us, yeah. Yeah, but I've never ever been in it. To, I know it was refurbished recently and it is, you know, comes under a kind of listed building. Um, but the most interesting one I think that I actually saw was um, in Kouris. Um, and the, the, at the Abbey in Kouris, there's a little cemetery next to it. And they had one. And actually, at the door was open, and I managed to go in and take a couple of photographs. And it was really just looked as if it just been left at the really old fashioned fireplace and, you know, where where people would actually have, have slept to, to guard over the bodies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, generally. and then in, um, well, in a lot of the cemeteries, but there's two in particular quite close to each other at Greyfriars that have the mort safe, mm -hmm. the iron grid. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, actually walking around the cemeteries in Scotland, you do see a lot of that, you know, you've got, you know, obviously the slabs that went onto the ground and the mort safes that, that, that stopped the kind of grave robbers as well. And then, you know, obviously you had a lot of these ones that had cages and bars around right. about them, and then a lot of the bars were removed during the war when they were... Oh, for the iron. They needed the metal, obviously, for munitions and things as well. So, yeah, there's a lot of little clues that you don't think about when you walk around yeah. a cemetery. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, thanks very much to Graham. And um, we will drop back in again probably the end of September, start of October, um, to chat about the next Kilted Culture event. And also, we'll have another presentation for you then as well. So, yeah, that's it. Just we could maybe do one when we're together. We could, yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is the other thing that we didn't tell you, <laughs> <laughs> is that Christine's actually coming to Scotland very soon, so we've got a couple of, <laughs> of jam-packed days um, organised um, sightseeing in Scotland, and um, yeah, so we're really excited about it, so, so no, yes. we'll, we'll be reporting back on that, and there'll be photographs, <laughs> photographs in the group, no doubt as well. Absolutely. <laughs> I know, I know. So we'll catch you all next time. Thank you very much for joining us today. <laughs> See ya. Bye.